Nehemiah. And last week we, we, we looked at, and I hope that, that we kind of took three really simple things home. That Nehemiah teaches us, anybody that's ever wanted to rebuild anything, right? Anybody that's ever wanted to rebuild a relationship, uh, rebuild and restore a friendship, and rebuild and restore a partnership, a business, so it's leadership, organizational stuff, it's interpersonal stuff, it's even life stuff. Okay, so along it, the gamut of, of what we deal with as people, if you've ever been in that position, Nehemiah gives us a, a model to follow. He gives us a model and that begins by asking, like, what's wrong? What's going on? What, 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 is, what are you seeing that I'm not? And then to fight the errors that most guys fight, to not just act and to go to fix, but to take it before God and pray, to seek his guidance and his will and his strength, and then finally, finally to act. And so last week, I gave you an assignment. What? And for the winter, I was going to get you a donut, but I didn't because I couldn't make it through the snow. <laughs> You guys feel bad for me, I know. <clears throat> but I asked us all to kind of think about going, what did you see? Meaning, did, did, did we risk as individuals and as people of God, did we go, God, what am I not seeing out there? What do you want me to start? What have you called me to? What have you uh, asked me to, to consider rebuilding? Anybody, anybody, did anybody see anything new or be broader? Did the Holy Spirit stir anything in your heart? I don't want to. Come on, work with me, people. Fake it. Fake it till you make it. Okay. Then I want to ask you the other ones. How'd you pray? And what'd you do? So I don't feel bad about not getting you donuts. <laughs> But if you've ever asked, if you've ever went to a spouse or a friend and asked what's wrong, if you've ever went to a child and said, hey, what's bugging you? If you've ever sat in a group of people in your business and went, how can I fix this? And if you've ever been told and then taken a step back and went, holy mackerel, this is huge, then you know where Nehemiah was. You see, Nehemiah asked his friends in, in, in the first three verses of chapter one of the book. He says, hey, what's going on? And, and Nehemiah responds. Nehemiah's friends say in verse three of chapter one, it says, things aren't going well for those who return from the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and distress or disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Like when you think that, it's like it's an immense problem. Right? It's an immense thing. So if we modernize this and we start talking about today, if you if you go to your spouse who dearly loves you, and you go, honey, what's wrong? And you hope that the answer is like, oh, not much, but if you help clean the dishes, you'll make me happy. You're like, oh, God, thank you. It's minor. I can do the dishes. Can I, anybody? Okay, so, right, so when you go to someone you love and you know something's amiss, and yet you hope that it's small and manageable. Like, really small and really manageable. Like, it'd help if you actually picked up your stuff off the floor. I'm not going to do that. Will that make you happy? It'll make me ecstatic, David. <laughs> I got this. Are you ever going to help in the house? Yes, honey, I'll vacuum on Friday. And will that make you happy? Yes, David, that'll make me happy. I can do that too. But sometimes when we ask, it's bigger than the small things. Sometimes when we ask, we find out that the brokenness is larger than what we think. And dare I say, sometimes the brokenness is bigger than what we can accomplish ourselves even after praying. And that's what, that's what Nehemiah faced when he asked his brothers and people from Judah, hey, what's going on in Jerusalem? Because he, he was given such a huge task 
He had to be taken back. And what we see when Nehemiah asked in, in, in chapter 2, verse 2, that he changed. And we all kind of know that, right? We know that when we ask and we get an answer to the question, and it's an honest answer, we can't turn the clock back. You can't go, oh, God, I wish I didn't ask. I mean, you might say that, but you still have the information in your head. And you, you, you're, you're changed. It, it reshapes you and changes you. And now let me ask, let me, and I forgot to say this to you guys last week, maybe because of the time. But in couples and in, in, in marriages, sometimes when, when we sit down and it's, it's a tough time and we know we got to talk to one another, right? And it's just been tough. And it's like, I don't want to ask Dave because it's going to lead me to a fight. Because it always leads to a fight. Go publicly someplace and sit down over dinner or over coffee and have a conversation. Because it's really hard to be problematic in public. Right? You can't really go after one another when someone's bringing you a dinner roll. I, if you can, then jump the dinner and then go straight to counseling. But one of the ways that you can control the back and forth that you get is, is go someplace where other people are around. Because other people around provide a filter to where you're not so ready to, to attack each other. Well, that's, that's for free. That's what we learned in our counseling session. So we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> so if you in verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, it says, The king asked me, remember Nehemiah writing firsthand, so why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. And then I was terrified. And I replied, long live, the, long live the king, how can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors were buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And if you have your Bibles and you, you underline or circle or highlight, verse 4 is profound. And the king asked, how can I help you? You see, that in that simple question, that simple verse, that so many times I have went by, is... The reinforcing of what we talked about last week. It says when you're called to rebuild and you're called to restore and the Holy Spirit opens your heart up to participate in something that you're needed, then God himself will provide. If you are called to rebuild something, you are also provided something. That you are not alone in the journey when God calls, God provides. And sometimes God provides in the most unexpected of places. You see, when you're, when you're talking about life and when you're talking about something that is precious to you and something that, that you know that God has put on your heart. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. June's watching ESPN right now. <laughs> Where were we? Oh. <laughs> if we know that when we ask and then we pray, then God provides us with resources, then we also have to be open that the resources that come our way are unexpected. For Nehemiah was a slave, right? Nehemiah served the king. Nehemiah had a great prestigious position, but Nehemiah was also part of the exile of Jerusalem. Nehemiah was owned by the king. Nehemiah was a slave. And so for the king to ask Nehemiah, hey, what do you need? That must have blown Nehemiah's mind. That's like hitting the Powerball jackpot, $1.5 billion. Like, are you, the king's asking you what he can do. The king, right? The guy with the, what is it, the black American Express card that's metal, unlimited. You can buy an island with it. That's the king. The king has all the money that you'd ever need, all the resources that you ever need, anything that you would need to accomplish what God has told you. 
And if you were, if I was Nehemiah, I'd be like, yes, I scored. And then I would get out my list because if you've ever had to rebuild something, you already have a list in your head of what needs to be done. Any person that's ever asked, hey, what do you need? If they're honest, can give you five or six things of what they need you to do to make a relationship, a partnership, a friendship better. Right? And so if, if someone was, if I was in Nehemiah's shoes and the king asked me, I'd be like, oh, great king of mine. What do I need? I need, and I would have a lot of lists, and I'd be like, hey, you know, can you pay off the car because I've got to go to Jerusalem and the paychecks aren't going to, they're not going to pay me to go there. Or I'd be like, you know, I have this relationship with my dear wife and she's stressed. Can you send us to Tahiti? <laughs> to the bungalows. Right, the bungalows, everybody know what the bungalows are? The bungalows that are over the water, because that would make us happy, and that would fix our relationship, and then we would be close, so when I go to Jerusalem, I'd be all happy, and my wife would be happy, and a happy wife is a happy wife, and so you would begin to just, man, I need this, and I need that, and I need this, and I need that, and I would take advantage of the resources that, in my opinion, God had brought to me. But Nehemiah shows us that the single most important thing along this journey of restoration and rebuilding is not the accumulation of resources. It goes back to prayer. Because he ends at the end of verse 4, if you have it. The king says, how can I help you? What can I do for you, Nehemiah? I care about you, Nehemiah. And then verse 4 says, and with a prayer to the God in heaven. But before Nehemiah cashed the check, before Nehemiah accumulated help, before Nehemiah had him, he prayed. He prayed. You've heard us talk a lot in this church about in the last few months about prayer. And sometimes when we talk about prayer, we talk about an event. Everybody show up on Wednesday night and we'll pray for the church. Come Wednesday Sunday morning and we'll pray for the church. But you see, the reason in the rebuilding process that prayer can't stop, that prayer is constant, that at every step along the way we go before God, it is not a sense of request. It's not me going to a friend and going, what else can you help me with? I know that you helped me here, but now help me there. No, prayer is a continuing conversation with God that reminds the person that is called by God to accomplish something that he or she is never alone. You see, if I pray, then I acknowledge the fact that I'm not over here all by myself. That it is not just me that has been called. It is not just me that carries all the weight. That the relationship I have with God, and I ask God, God, show me what you want me to do, is always accompanied. Is always accompanied by a conversation. By a conversation. And so even before, and all the time that he provides, the king himself says, hey, what can I do? And before Nehemiah answers, he prays. And please hear that. That when we ask, we continually ask all along the journey. And all along the journey of restoration, we continue to pray. You see, a relationship that's broken is not repaired. The, the, the one time that we have an honest conversation and we make a list, i got to do this now. A relationship is restored much like the walls were restored over and over again. And we see that, that Nehemiah asked God and he's called and he's going to, okay, I'm going to go. But then he goes to the king and the king says, what's going on? The king asks, and please hear this. The king asks. So all in our lives when we are struggling, when we want to rebuild something, what we will discover from the God who provides for our needs, the very thing that someone else asks of us is our provision. And our ability to make the request 
and say, I need this, is the very thing that someone else might have been praying for. What can I do? Do you understand that? Does that kind of make sense to you? So I can be messed up. My wife and I can be just having a tough time. And we can go, God, help us. What do we need to do? And then we, 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 we ask each other, what, what's going on here? And then we pray. But what sometimes we don't know is a parent or a friend is praying for us that sees something in our lives and says, are you guys okay? And then they pray. God, I, I noticed that Dave and Zan are, are struggling and having a tough time. I don't know what to do. And then they act. <clears throat> so if, if Mendel senses something in our relationship and Mendel goes before God and says, man, God, I just don't know what to do. He asks. And then he asks us, hey, what's going on? And the very thing that he's praying, what can I do for them? The very response that he gives, hey, dude, here, go out to dinner. I know you're stressed out. Go out to dinner. We'll buy. That gift, that action is a prayer, answer to prayer to the very thing that we don't know what we're doing. And so when we see the king in this story, though he doesn't know God, he kind of does. And, and the... the, the, the that tension between him and Nehemiah is a, resp a response to Nehemiah's prayer. He says, and so he goes, if it pleases the king, and if you're pleased with me, verse 5, your servant send me to Judah and to rebuild the whole city where my ancestors are buried. And then he asks a bunch of stuff. He asks for letters of safe passing. He asks for wood to rebuild the gates. He asks for workmen. And then he says he headed to Jerusalem in verse 11. And it says, so I arrived in Jerusalem three days later, and I slipped out during the night, taking only others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. And we're going to talk about this next week. But please understand that not everybody needs to know nor should know your business. Let me say that for all you open book people here. <laughs> Not everybody needs to know your business. Definitely not Facebook. <laughs> Do I need to go on? No. Because <laughs> I can park there for a while. <laughs> so if you have a, if you need like, hey, my wife is really struggling with me now. Please pray for me. That just doesn't work. Nehemiah saw a need, asked, prayed, went, acted. And yet, what he did was he went and checked for himself. To check what you feel like God has called you to do, to confirm what you feel like God has called you to do, is not a lack of faith, it's just wisdom. Right, so before Nehemiah said, hey, guess what I'm going to do? You're not going to believe what God called me. And how many, I mean, pastors are famous for this. We, we, we get desperate. God shows us something and we go to the congregation. Well, what we're going to do now is whatever. And yet it's, it's wisdom to check for yourself what, what you think. and Confirm for yourself what you think you heard. Especially if you're called to do something in his name. Ask a friend, ask, get wisdom, get insight. Right, but anyways, Nehemiah slips into Jerusalem and he says, we took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. And after dark, verse 13, I went out through the valley gate, past the Jekyll gate and over the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. How must it, bad it must have been. How bad broad the scope of devastation must have been that the donkey couldn't even make its way over that. In verse 16, the city official did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, to the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said, 
Now I said after I confirmed what I knew God had called me to do. Now that I said when I asked and I prayed and now I'm here, I confirmed what I saw. You know very well the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. He invited others to help what he felt he was called to rebuild. The job was simply too big for himself to accomplish. No matter how great, and there's a bunch of books on Nehemiah's leadership and everything else, but a key principle to Nehemiah is his ability to ask for help. And if you've ever been embarrassed by what you're called to do, if you've ever looked at your life and went, man, my life is a jacked-up mess. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this hole. Ask for help. Ask for help. It says, verse 18, I told them, them, the people that were locked up in Jerusalem, about the gracious hand of God on had been on me and about my conversation with the king, and they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. Let us us rebuild the wall. Jerusalem would have never been rebuilt if Nehemiah didn't have the courage to ask for help. The walls would have never been done. Nehemiah might have killed himself, said, look at me, I'm serving God. Look at how awesome I am. What are you doing? I'm building these miles of walls. Do you need any help? No, it's just me and God. Can we get an amen? It's just me and God. Hallelujah. Just me and Jesus is going to accomplish everything. But that is not the biblical model of the body of Christ. So, here's the kicker. Nehemiah blows apart, blows up, Three myths, or four myths, that the people of God in today's world tell themselves. Number one, I can do it by myself. If God called me, then it's my calling. I don't need any help. Which leads us into ne the next one. I don't need any help because it's just me and Jesus. Just me and Jesus. And we kind of say it with a slight grin and a tilted head and eyeballs that flutter. Just me and Jesus. You can't find that in Scripture. Sorry. Well, I don't like the church. Neither do I sometimes. And I like work for it. <laughs> but you cannot find in Scripture... That's just me and God and me and Jesus. You can't. You see, what happens when it says me and Jesus? And this is where I think we miss it. You see, if I am the person that's sitting over here and I'm asking God, God, what do you want me to do? And God shows me something. And then I pray. How can I operate this way? And then I ask the person that shows me. And their response is, no, I don't need any help. It's just me and Jesus. Then, then what that person's doing to me is robbing me of my opportunity to be obedient. You see, if I can't help anybody, though God's called me to help, if I can't participate in a great endeavor, because nobody seems to think that they need any sort of help because, you know, if you ask for help, then you don't have the faith in God or any other thing that we, we talk about in Christian worldviews. If we cannot accept help, then we rob the person who is called by God to help from a blessing that is rightfully his or hers when they help. Does that make sense? So if you've ever had to work with your hands and you want to be a part of something and you're making something awesome and the person you're working alongside with just tells you to sit down and ignore it, just say, just leave me alone, I can do this by myself. Then the person that wants to help never learns, never grows, and never has a sense of accomplishment. Right, so Nehemiah tells us Number one, we can't just be me and God. Number two, it's not just me and Jesus. Number three, 
The sad third one is like, I really don't have anything to contribute. Peter tells us, and we quoted this last time, Peter tells us that we, like living stones, are being built up to a spiritual house. Paul writes to the Corinthian church that we are the body of Christ, all work in concert one another to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We can all contribute, and finally, what it does, when we ask for help, and when we allow ourselves to partner with other people, it reminds us that we're never alone in our brokenness. That we are never, ever, ever alone in our brokenness. No matter what you face today, God wants to remind you that you're not alone. That you're not alone. You see, when God calls us to something to rebuild and to restore, when God reveals his heart that we are not destined and it's not our, our, our lot in life to live amongst the rubble of brokenness, the enemy wants to convince you that you're alone in the endeavor. The enemy wants to convince you that there's no way you're going to make a difference because to make it just too big, and yet if God wants to tell you anything this morning, it's like, man, you are not alone. You're just not. There's a story in Exodus 17 about Moses. And we'll end with this story. It says that, that and this was after Moses led the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And they came to a battle. And they were fighting, I think it was the Amalekites. And, and, and so Moses saw that the battle was happening. And he told, he told Joshua, who was his second in command, he said, get some men ready. And you're going to go fight these guys. And I'm going to go up on a hill. And I'm going to basically pray for you. And so it says Moses went out. And, and how the story went is like it says that Moses, when he raised his hands, then the nation was winning. And the battle swung in favor of the Israelites. And when he lowered his hands, the battle would swing in favor of his enemies. And to make it even more real, to make it kind of get it in your head what Moses must have saw, when he raised his hands, he saw his enemies die. And when he lowered his hands, he saw his countrymen die. What kind of weight must have that been? To see a valley of people that you had led, people that you had watched eat, people that you had watched drink, people that had experienced freedom. Now, God puts you up on a hill and says, raise your hands, Moses. And as long as your hands are held up high, they win. As long as you, when your hands drop, they lose their life. It says in verse 12 of that story, it says, Moses' arms became tired, and he could no longer hold them up. And I wonder how many people here this morning, arms are just tired. You've been called to do something and you, you, it resonates with you, the story of Moses, because maybe you're the one that holds the family together. As long as your hands are up and as long as you hold it all together, as long as you, you work it out, then you have, you see health in your, in your family and in your life. You see something that resonates, but you get tired and it's like, man, I haven't got nothing. And you watch it fall apart. Your weariness is not a sign of failure. Your weariness is not a sign of failure. Your weariness is a sign of humanity. And because it's a sign of humanity, God has put people in their wings to hold up their hands. You just have to ask. You see, with Moses, it says in verse 12 and 13, it says, Moses and Aaron, or, or Aaron and her, her found a stone for him to sit on. She found Moses a place to sit. 
And they stood on each side of him, holding up his hands. And they did it. And his hands held steady until sunset. And the nation was victorious. So who gets the credit? Moses, because Moses is the great man of God, and Moses has done all this stuff in God, him and God. Or is it the two men that you don't really hear much about until later who <laughs> saw the need and then had the courage and the boldness to offer help? And Moses had the humility and the wisdom to accept that help. You see, the story doesn't say like, hey, what's that for? I don't need nothing. Moses, you're about ready to pass out. I'm good. I can go another couple hours. Moses, people are dying around you. Ah, I'm good. No, the story is, is that Moses, a great man of God who would watch the sea part, accepts help. Accepts the help that I would be so bold as to say God placed in his in his way. Aaron and Ur should have been out on the battlefield. But they were standing on the side of their leader watching. And then they had the boldness to come out and say, they'll just help. So for the Moses is in the room. You know, you guys that hold everything together. You guys that feel like you are alone in your endeavor. That... You are called to do something, and yet you're looking, man, I am tired. Turn to the left and to the right of you and begin to see where your help comes from. Because you're not alone. You're never alone. That God sees your weariness and has placed men and women in your life to help you. All that you have to do is ask. Oh, and that's tough, man. I know that's tough. Trust me, I know that's tough. My wife's like, see? <laughs> but you never get what you've been praying for. And God provides if you don't accept help. See, that's a story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah himself was called and himself prayed and then himself went to Jerusalem to see and then he accepted the help of his king and the help of his countrymen to rebuild what he himself was called to do. What his countrymen could not do before, seven years before. What they had failed at, they now succeed at because they work in concert with one another. And one last group of people, the Aaron and the Ur's, hers. How do you say that, Wayne? What's that word? Her? Her. Her. Thank you. I was calling that. Aaron and hers of the room. The men and women who see things. You see friends struggling and tired. You see a spouse weary. You see a co-worker just dangling. The Aaron and the hers who do not see to think they can offer anything of substance. It's time to step out of the shadows, you guys. It's time to realize that your participation in the call of God is as vital or more vital than the person that was called to do it because without your assistance, it would have never accomplished it. It would have never happened. You see, greatness is not defined by the size of your calling. Greatness is defined by how your actions reflect God. Even the song that we sang, you deserve it all. You deserve it all. 23 Church, I love you guys because you don't poke your fingers at people that are weary. But because you don't poke your fingers at people that are weary, you have a responsibility every once in a while to saddle up next to somebody that even now God's speaking to you about and grab their arm and hold it up until they can catch their breath. Because your assistance is a determiner 
of their victory. Your assistance. I don't have nothing to offer. What you offer is vital. What you offer is vital. So this week, it says in verse 13, as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalekite in battle. Each of us plays a vital role in what God's called us to here. Each of us plays a vital role in the friends we sit next to lives. Each of us plays a vital role in our marriage with our kids at our job. Each of us do. For some of us, we have been called to try to do things for God, and for others of us, we have been called to assist those. Whatever you're called to. It's vital. It's vital. And the overall thing of what God wants to do here at 23 in your marriage and in your, your, your friendships at times needs help, man. I'm trying to remember what I'm supposed to be doing. But understand, you guys are not alone. No matter where you find yourself today, whether you're on a hill ready to collapse, whether you're looking at a marriage wondering if it'll last a week, whether you go to work tomorrow with a boss that is just an idiot, you're not alone. God hears the cries of your heart. God hears your prayers. God sees your need. And he responds. Amen? Amen. Let me stand.